You started to get ready to go. Ready to go. Okay, then. So, um, although the other day we talked about the, the presets, this is the first, the, the actual Dharma talks as such. Um, Buddhism is quite unlike other religions because it doesn't go pushing itself on people, trying to convert. You don't go Buddhists trying to convert people to Buddhism. No. In fact, monks, who are obviously the ones who usually do the Dharma talks, they're not allowed to teach the Dharma to anyone unless they're requested. So when you'll notice a thing like this going on in the hall there, where there are monks coming and giving Dharma talks, the people chant a little few stanzas of Pali, which is requesting officially the monk to teach. Um, so we can't just go out, you know, standing on a soapbox on the corner, shouting about how wonderful Buddhism is, you know. Um, of course, most other religions teach that you've only got one life, one chance, you know, to get it right. After that, that's it. But Buddhism teaches rebirth, many lives, many chances. So if you're not a Buddhist, this life, that's, you know, there's more. So you might get the, the, the story or the message some life in the future. <laughs> yeah. So it's not such a big deal for us, you know. Um, but of course, Buddhism is classed as a religion amongst the other main formal religions. Um, but also, many people say, well, it's not really religion, it's more like a way of life or a philosophy. People refer to it more as a philosophy. Um, The other religions, nearly all the other religions, believe in a god or gods, um, and so they're theistic. Buddhism is referred to as non-theistic, but it doesn't because it doesn't believe in a god. The Buddha never actually mentioned an almighty, eternal, creative god, and never said there was no such thing. He just ignored. It's not. If there, by any chance, there should be such a, uh, a creator being, he's irrelevant to our daily life and our practice to perfect ourselves. That's the way we see it. Uh, so, where just about every religion believes in a God and you follow the teachings of that God. And nearly all of them say you've got this one life, one chance to get it right, and at the end of that life, you either go to heaven or hell, depending on whether you've been a good or a bad boy. And that's it, eternity. Buddhism, it's not the only religion which teaches many lives. Most people have heard of reincarnation, but actually Buddhism doesn't teach reincarnation. The religion that was around when it started, uh, the present Hindu, Brahmin, other religion, they have a version of reincarnation, but the Buddha taught that that version is not correct. And so Buddhists teach what we call rebirth. It sounds like just a play on words, but there is a difference between rebirth and reincarnation. So for us, we have many, many lives. Not only us, all beings in fact. Um, all beings in all the realms. Um, because we see life as a constant cycle. There's um, a word, a Pali word called samsara, which is for this constant cycle of life and death. And we said that there are uh, 31 realms existing from the hells up to the heavens and beings existing in these realms going up and down from different level to different level depending upon their karma they're creating in their lives. So, and another thing Buddhism teaches is that the past is infinite, the future is infinite, no beginning, 
no end. So therefore we have always existed in one form or another. So because of this beginningless time, we have been living always in these 31 realms. Because we're trapped in this 31 realms until we escape to what the Buddha refers to as Nirvana. We haven't escaped yet. We're still born. So we're still in this cycle. Um, and so we've been in every one of these realms in the past. We've been in the hells, we've been in the heavens, we've been human, male, female, king, beggar, whatever, we've done everything. You know, we've been a raper, we've been a person being raped, we've been a soldier, a murderer, we've done everything, you know. We've been every kind of animal, we've been every kind of hungry ghost and things. Every one of those, we've been there in the past, because the infinity is a long one, so we've had a chance to experience every one of those things. And the Buddha said, the reason we're still stuck in this constant cycle is because of ignorance. You'll find in Buddhism they use the word ignorance quite a lot. Not in its present meaning. Nowadays if you call somebody ignorant they think you're causing them stupid and they'll get angry, you know, probably hit you on the nose. But ignorance merely means not knowing the truth. Ignorant of what is really the truth, or having an incorrect understanding or interpretation of the truth. So it's because of our ignorance of the truth that we make mistakes and come back again and again and again and again. And the Buddha said to his monks, he says, come on monks, he says, you've been wandering back and forth, up and down in all these realms for so long, and about time you got bored with all this suffering. Now, just about every religion, the head of the religion, whether it's Jesus or Allah or whatever, you could say that they've discovered some truth and they're pointing at the truth and want you to pay attention. But what happens in almost every case is instead of looking at the truth, they're looking at the finger. And they follow it down and make a religion out of the person doing the pointing, missing the whole point. You know. Even Buddhism is the same. So they make a religion out of the Buddha, Buddhism. He never tried to start Buddhism. He didn't want to start a religion based around him. He didn't even want people making Buddha images. But it happens. People have got this natural inclination to worship. You know, paying respect to somebody worthy of respect is great. That's why we bow down, do prostrations to the Buddha. We're respecting him as our great teacher, as we should respect all teachers. Um, but that doesn't mean to say we're worshipping him. Some people from other religions who have not studied anything to do with Buddhism, even some people with a simple understanding of Buddhism, might think the Buddha is our version of a god and we're actually praying to him. But we're not praying. When they're chanting, what they're doing is chanting the praises to the Buddha, the, the, triple, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so they're, they're saying what a wonderful teacher he was, you know, and what he did to achieve becoming a Buddha, and his teaching, how wonderful the teaching is, and how wonderful the monks and people are who practice that and bring us the teaching and things. But we're not worshipping him as a god, you know. It wouldn't have any effect anyway. Even if the Buddha was sat here alive and well now, he couldn't wave a magic wand and make us reach Nirvana. He points the way, shows us how to do it, but we've got to do the work. He can't do it for us. Only we can save ourselves. So this is, sometimes I say Buddhism is not a religion for the, the lazy. Because most other religions, those that, that have a god or gods, people are praying to a god, beseeching a god, making promises, oh, if you give me this, I'll do that, you know. And that's looking for help outside of ourselves. But the Buddha said, none of that. The only one that can help you is you, which is inside. And the only way we can help ourselves is practicing what he taught. You know, he said you could walk around holding his robe for, for, for 40 years, following him around. But if you don't pay any attention to his teaching, you're, not, you're distant from him. But somebody who listens, puts into practice what he teaches, you're close to him. So Buddhism is all about practice, not just study. Study is okay, it's interesting, but study is not ultimately going to get you there. You can read every book there is printed in Amazon.com about Buddhism 
and all of the Buddhist scriptures, but it wouldn't get you to nirvana just <coughs> reading about it. Because the scriptures, the teachings, the books and all that, they're just a map. How to get from here to nirvana. If I want to get to London, I need a map to show me how to get to London. I don't need to see postcards of London, you know, Trafalgar Square, the Houses of Parliament, very interesting but ultimately useless, and they'll be a bit on the path. I need to know the correct path. Yeah. So I don't need to understand Nirvana, it's actually beyond our understanding until we reach it. So arguing about it and spending time, wasting time thinking about it is not this. We just need to know that that's the goal. We need to have a good map. And these Dharma talks, these Dharma books all add to the map, make it a bit better, you know, instead of just knowing there's a bend roughly there. We know exactly where the bend is and, and we can recognise it because there's signposts, you know, so get it. the more books and, and Dharma we read and Dharma talks we get, it makes the map more detailed. But it's still a map. You've got to start walking. If you just sit there collecting maps, you know, you've got a huge collection of maps, you haven't gone anywhere, you're not going to get anywhere until you start. Another example somebody said was the, the five precepts, you know, they're like, a, a, a ticket to get on a train to Nirvana. And so you're there collecting tickets, you go to somewhere, and they, they give you a precepts before you, they start the ceremony here. You know, you go to a funeral and the monks will come to chant, the first thing they'll do is give the people the five precepts. You know. By taking those precepts, you're trying to make an effort to be good, to stop creating bad karma, which is the first step on the way. So it's like a train ticket, every time you get the precepts, you've got to say, oh, I've got a wonderful place. See, this ticket's great. You know, get on this train and take you to Nirvana. You've got to use the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we left off. No. I'm glad I got that though. I needed to get that point. That was really good. Yeah. All right. Hold on a second. E, can you make sure try to get it back to where we had it? Yes, sir. It moved it tightly. The other one's still running. Yeah, the yeah. One, other one's been going. Okay. How's the battery on yours? I've got product placement. You've got full. Wow. Yeah. Pure product. I've <laughs> got a little product placement. Buddhism uh, sponsored by Calcutta. Okay. Brought to you in part by <laughs> Soda. Well, you've got the Thai version, Lee, obviously. Yeah. So, uh, as you say, the study is not the main thing, the practices. Of course, when we start, we come to Buddhism, first of all, most people coming to Buddhism, like foreigners, are converting from some, they've been brought up in some other place, so they're, they're interested in, in Buddhism or actually determined to become a Buddhist or something. So they're doing a lot of study, reading Dharma books and this. But it is just study, it's not the, the practice. Once we know enough about how to practice, we should put the books down and start practicing. We will learn more from the practice itself. I mean, we can still look at the books occasionally and, and they can guide us. It's better to have a teacher, but not everyone can have a teacher, you know. Um, you can ask questions to a teacher, you can't ask questions of a book. But on the internet nowadays you've got many resources, you know, forums and, and things, and if you do know a teacher, you can ask questions by email or even chat on, on things like Skype. So the, the opportunities now are, are much better than they were. But um, you need to check up on your progress, but the practice is the main thing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's two main aspects, most important aspects of the practice. One, the first one, is keeping those precepts, at least the five precepts, as well as you can. Because those are preventing you creating bad karma. And then the second is the meditation. The meditation is the most important part of the practice. Chanting is interesting and uh, good, but it, it won't get you to nirvana by itself. You could chant your whole life away it won't get you to move on. It might refine your spirit and make you put you on that level, but it won't 
it's not enough by yourself. You've got to do the meditation. And um, we say that the Vipassana meditation, which is mindfulness, is the one we have to practice. That's the one the Buddha taught. So, the Buddha didn't start the religion of Buddhism. What he did was he taught what we call the Dharma. In Thai, they call the Dharma Tamma. And their name for nature is Tamma Cha, which points out that Dharma is just nature, natural laws. So if it's natural laws, these laws apply all through those 31 realms on this earth, but they also apply throughout the universe to all beings, whether you believe in them or not, whether you understand them or not, whether you know about them or not, they still apply. Not knowing is no excuse, you know, not knowing you're going to make mistakes. If I went to America, I'm, I'm English and used to driving on the left, you know, and, and here in Thailand we drive on the left. I went to America, I started driving on the left and had an accident. The policeman said, hey, you're supposed to drive on the right. Oh, I didn't know. Sorry. That's no excuse. Sorry. Ignorance is no defense. You should find out. So, we make these mistakes, but it's causes us to come back again and again and again and again, because we don't know. We don't know the truth. Now, the Buddha, he teaches the truth. But our chance to learn the truth is so tiny because Buddhas are very rare indeed. And in fact, even the chance to be born human is very rare and precious indeed. That's why Buddhism places great importance on parents, mothers and fathers. How we treat our mother and father is very important. They put them on the same standing as virtually an arahant, who is one who has reached nirvana. Um, because if you create bad karma with somebody, say I create bad karma with you, you know, it's bad. I might even kill you. That's very bad. I might go to hell for it. But if you kill one of your parents, you are guaranteed, you know, do not pass go. <laughs> do not collect a hundred dollars, go straight to jail. You will go to the deepest hell for an eon, which is a huge long period of time. Uh, so, parents, uh, we should always respect our parents, we should uh, never cause them to be sad or unhappy and shed tears over us. Um, we should take care of them when they're old. Because otherwise, you know, if you neglect your parents, your own life will not be successful. Um, my first teacher was a monk down near Bangkok who is considered to be an arahant and books about his life. He they, they, tells many stories about he was the abbot of his temple and the big meditation temple and many stories about people coming with their daily problems and and. Uh, he would advise them. And, uh, he had some special abilities because of his lot of experience with meditation, so he could know what people were thinking. And he could also see their past come from past lives. So he could know the reasons for their present problems. On one occasion, uh, a man and woman came to see him and said, look, we, we had quite a successful business, but now it's going downhill and looks like it could possibly uh, go bust. And he says, well, what about the monks at home, the arahants at home? Because the Thais refer to your parents, as I said, as the monks at home or the arahants at home. And we should have great respect. And they said, we don't have any monks in our home. Said, what do you mean? Your parents, he says. What about them? How are you treating them? And these guys, they're living in a nice, comfortable house, you see. 
but they had the parents living in the servants' quarters out the back. Much poorer accommodation, eating with the servants, you know, no respect at all for your parents, which is bad. He said, why are they living separately? He didn't, they didn't tell him, but he knew. He says, you should bring them into your house, living comfortably with you, eating good food with you. At the very least, you should do that, you know. That won't necessarily wipe out the bad you've done, but... Um, so, we have to realise that uh, our parents are very important. And for Buddhism, they always see that. Now, without our parents, we wouldn't have got born human. So we have great, great respect for them. And I say this is, they say this is very rare and precious to be born human. I told you there's those 31 realms with beings existing in all of those realms. Some people say now, that, how come nowadays there's many more people born? Where are these people coming from? You know, new souls being created or what? And I say, well, there's 31 realms, you know, there's beings in the higher realms, in the heavens and things, and there's lower realms, animals and hell beings and things. And some of them are taking rebirth in the human realm all the time. They're up and down, back and forth, caught in this constant cycle. And one day the Buddha walked along and he stooped down and picked up some dust on his thumbnail and he said to his companions, what do you think, how do you compare this amount of dust here with the whole earth? I said, you can't com poss possibly compare, it's not the tiniest fraction is it, you know, how can you compare that? He says, this compares with the number of beings in the human realm. The whole earth compares with the number of beings in the four lower realms. You see this uh, thing here, there's this little chart that shows you the um, oh, yes. 31 realms. <coughs> so you've got the human realm there, number five. Below that, the four realms of misery, suffering. Animal realms, hell realms, hungry ghosts and demons. And so the whole earth is all the beings in those realms. Whereas that tiny amount of dust was the being in the human realm. Above it there are many realms, the heaven realms and other higher realms. I, I once heard another uh, description and it said, suppose you took all the beings in the human realm and stood them on the head of a pin then the very surface of the globe would be covered by beings in the higher realms. But if you then took all those beings from the higher realms and then stood them on the head of a pin, the surface of the globe would be covered by beings in the lower realms. So you see the human realm is the tiniest one of all. And it's the most important, it's the best realm to be in. Although some people think heaven's the, the better one because it's more comfortable, there's no suffering and very, very long lifetimes, you know. But, there's still lifetimes. Everything which is born must die. Every lifetime, whether it's a lifetime like a, a mosquito of a couple of days, or a lifetime of a being in a higher realm, which is thousands of eons, it's still a lifetime. And it eventually comes to an end. Even the beings we call gods, like the, the Brahma, who's the chief god of the uh, Hindus, or the Indra and other gods, we refer to them as gods, but they're not the, the capital G creator, all important, you know, mighty important creator of the universe, God, but they are God. They do have creative abilities and they have special powers, but they're still caught in the same trap as everyone else. When their time is up, they will then take rebirth in these lower realms. And it all depends on your karma. Where you go, you see. Not only the karma you've just created in this present life, but past karma, you can't remember your past life, so you don't know how much karma is. So, we've all been going up and down, back and forth, creating karma. You know, you can imagine it's like a bank. In a bank account, your money's either in the black or in the red. Can't be both at the same time, can it? Cancel each other out. But karma's different. It's like two separate bank accounts. One for the black, one for the red. And they don't cancel each other out. So we've all got accounts with good and bad karma. The good karma brings a good result. The bad karma brings a bad result. But they don't cancel each other out. 
So doing good karma now is not going to wipe away the bad karma you did before, earlier in this life or in a past life. But there are ways to escape. If you get the message, meet the Buddha's teaching. I'm very fortunate enough to meet the Buddha's teaching and put it into practice. You can get on that way, on the way to. You can start journeying on that map towards Nirvana. Um, you get to a certain point where it's a point of no return. There's no falling back. You're in the fast track. Oh, okay. And then you're guaranteed to reach Nirvana very, very shortly. But uh, I'll, I'll come back to that later on. But um, then, of course, once you reach Nirvana, you're no longer reborn, so past karma's all wiped out. You can, it doesn't have a chance to have an effect. So, so the, the, the Buddha's teaching the Dharma. He's not creating the religion of Buddhism. And as I say, it's a natural law. Natural laws which affect all beings throughout the universe. So, now you look at another natural law, gravity. Gravity affects all beings, doesn't it? Whether we understand how it works or not. If I said to my, ah, I think gravity's a low rush, I don't believe in this anymore. I'm not going to suddenly drift away. It still works. Yeah. You know, rain falls on everybody. It doesn't avoid Christians, you know. <laughs> doesn't matter what religion. All these differences, we refer to ourselves, you know, different religions, <coughs> different countries and whatever even different sexes, it's all rubbish, you know, it's all just illusion. They're not real separate things. We're all together. You know, when we're in hell, there's one big iron pot, we're all in the same pot. Not one pot for Baptists, one for Methodists, one for Buddhists. These differences don't exist in reality, you know. So, they're all together. You know, in the heavens, we're all together. The animal realms, of course, they're just, you know, um, so we've been in all those rooms and, and we're still stuck in the same cycle until we get the message. And I said, it's very rare to be born human, but it's even rarer to be born human and to meet a Buddha because Buddhas are very rare indeed. And they don't achieve what, they don't become Buddha just in one lifetime. Their final lifetime they become the Buddha, but they have been practicing and leading up to it, perfecting themselves over countless billions and billions and billions and billions of eons from the time they first decided they wanted to become a Buddha. Um, the time scale of Buddhism is actually absolutely huge and mind-boggling. Um, we refer, this comes under what they, they probably call the um, cosmology of Buddhism. But it's very similar, you'll find if you look at the internet and look at the, the Hindu religion, they have their Vedas and, and stuff, and it, the time scale is very similar. They talk about a day of Brahma, because he's their chief god, and they divide this day of Brahma up into sections, so many billions of years, and you know, until that's one eon. This word eon we refer to is, is the basic unit of time in Buddhism. And one eon is basically the time from one Big Bang to the next. Because you have the Big Bang, the expansion of the universe, contraction of the universe, big crunch, boom, new Big Bang. Big crunch, new Big Bang. The, 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 the Hindu Vedas talk about the same thing. It's cyclic. Everything in nature is cyclic. You've got the, the seasons, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall. Um, Spring, the, the flowers come out. Summer, they change to fruits. Fall, the leaves fall off. Winter, the trees look as though they're dead, you know, and then they rebirth, there's root growth. Everything in nature is cyclic. You know, why aren't we the same? We're cyclic. You know, our cycle, of course, is being born, getting sick, getting old, dying, reborn, sick, old, dying, reborn, you know. Uh, the planets as well, you know, the, the universe itself reboots, you know. Some people say, this Big Bang Theory is all very good, where did it start from? How did it suddenly happen? What caused, where did the matter come from and the energy? Well, of course, it came from the past big crunch. So everything's coming together until it reaches a point and then suddenly, boom, it's off again. You know, boom, it's off again. Now, um, Einstein, he put forward this um, cyclic universe, the uh, oscillating universe theory. 
where he says you've got this expansion contraction be you know. um, so that certainly agrees with the Buddhist idea of an understanding of it now one time somebody said to the Buddha how long is an eon? Because they do refer to eons and things when they're talking about the, the teachings, the past lives, and how long the Buddhas practice, or as a bodhisattva. Uh, when they're training themselves, they're referred to as a bodhisattva until their final lifetime, they eventually become the Buddha. But uh, he was asked, How long is an eon? And he said, Well, it's very hard to describe how long it's a huge amount of time. How many thousands, hundreds of thousands of years? And the guy said, can it be done with a simile? He said, yes. Imagine there is a pit 60 kilometers long. Oh, you, you're in America. We'll say 10 miles. <laughs> 10 miles long, 10 miles wide, 10 miles deep. Once every 100 years, you throw in a sesame seed. When this pit is full, an eon is not yet complete. That's one story. You hear other stories. Another story is about a mountain. 10 miles high, 10 miles long, 10 miles wide. Solid rock, no crane, caves, cracks, fissures at all. Once every 100 years, a bird lands on top, wipes its beak and flies away. When the mountain's worn away completely level with the ground, an eon is not yet complete. You know, or another one, uh, uh, the same mountain, but once every hundred years, a deity comes down with a soft cloth, like a piece of silk, and just dusts the mountain over when it's worn away. I mean, if you had a piece of rock here and a hard rasp file, you might be able to reduce it to dust after a whole day's right? But wiping it with a piece of silk, your whole life, you'd probably polish it a bit, but that's all. But just one wipe every hundred years, where's it going to disappear? This piece of rock, what about the mountain, you know? Yeah. So it's a huge amount of time. And I say, it's, logically, it's, it's, rel it's relative to this sort of period from the beginning and end of the, the universe, so the new one. Um, but anyway, uh, it's a huge amount of time. Now, a Buddha trains himself for such a long time it's just I mean this work this single eon is a mind bogglingly long period. We all know that one day the sun will go over and the, the earth and other planets in our universe will will be destroyed. It's it's gonna happen. But um, when that does happen of course all these realms to submit. The first, the most fragile ones, if the sun started to overheat and that, the first ones which would be destroyed would be the human realm, we're the most vulnerable. And the animal realms would probably go with us. And then these other realms, the, the hungry ghosts, hell realms, heaven realms, they would disappear as well. And the earth itself would be destroyed. But all the beings existing in these realms would take rebirth in the highest realms, where there's no form at all, they're just pure thought. And they'll sit around enjoying the, the bliss of, you know, nothingness until it rebooted again. Yeah. So, uh, sorry about that. That's all right, no problem. You start again, okay? So, as I said, these natural laws, the Dharma, refer to all beings equally, whether they believe in them or not. It doesn't matter what religion you were brought up in. You know, the, we say that the Dharma works for all. And of course, the most important laws which really governs the whole universe is this law of karma. Karma is sort of cause and effect. You do good, you get a good result. You do bad, you get a bad result. 
you plant rice, you're not going to get apples. <laughs> if you plant rice today, you're not going to eat it tomorrow. You've got to wait for it to grow, mature, be ready for harvesting and all that. So it's going to be some time. So the karma you do now is not necessarily going to bring a result tomorrow. It might not even be in this lifetime. It might be in a future life. Maybe in millions of lives in the future. So, um, as I say, we can't see. Only very few people are able to see their past life. Some people who practice meditation do get these abilities. But most people can't remember their past lives. And so we don't know what karma we've created. As I say, we've all got this account, bank account, you know, good and bad karma. And all the time we're filling them up in all those lives. And of course we're using them up as well, you know. When a good thing happens, the good karma is used. When the bad thing happens, the bad karma is used. So we've suffered, obviously. Many times we've been in hells or been animals and things. And so we've been suffering the, res the results of the bad karma. Sometimes we've been in the heavens, you know, so we've had the good results. Um, we say the human real is the best because it's the best chance to learn and meet the Dharma, meet the Karma. In, in the higher realms, the heavens, when the Buddha's here, they do get a chance to listen to his teachings, you know. Every day at about uh, one minute past midnight, beings used to come down and attend a Dharma talk by the Buddha. They would arrive and appear and encircle him three times, paying respect, you know, going clockwise, but it's always goes clockwise, keeping the important thing on the right hand side. And then settle down quietly, no chatting, gossiping, they listen to the talk and go away. So when he's alive, they get this chance to receive Dharma talks. But then when he's died, he's gone. They don't have that chance. They're caught up in all the pleasures and, and good life up in the heavens. And forget it. Here in the human realm, even two and a half thousand years after the Buddha's gone, we've still got the Dharma, we've still got monks, temples, many chances to learn. So the human realm is the best. Animals have got no chance to learn the Dharma, no chance to make merit, do good karma. You know, extreme, very extremely rare occasions, maybe something like, you know, a guide dog for the blind or something is helping people. But generally, animals are not living close to people, they are only living in the wild and uh, they're just killing and being killed, you know. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're using up some of the bad karma that got them there, but they're also still creating bad karma. Um, in the hell realms, the suffering is extreme, but it's relatively short. They actually say that being reborn in the hell realm is better than being reborn in the animal realm. Because although the suffering is extreme, it doesn't last so long. Once you get caught in the animal realms, because they're mostly ignorant, they haven't got the high intelligence, then they're often trapped in the animal realm for many, many, many thousands and thousands of lifetimes. Um, so, now we've got the chance to get human, we should at least try and stay reborn human. It's not an easy thing to achieve. To, to, to be reborn human again, you've got at the least to keep those five precepts as well as you can. Nobody keeps them perfectly, we can't, we're not, we're, we are human, we make mistakes, you know, we get things wrong, we do break them, but when we do break them, we feel regret and we're determined to do better the next time. So as long as we're making the effort, now many people don't make the effort, because either they, they have no religious belief, they may be atheist or their religion says you've got one life, one chance, you know, they think if they get away with something and people who haven't seen it, and you know, uh, a drug dealer might have a really luxurious lifestyle and all the money he's made <coughs> might even escape getting put in prison. But they can't escape the law of karma. No way. He might not believe in karma. He might not believe in rebirth and afterlife and things, but he's going to get a shock. <laughs> you know, it's there, it's real. Um, rebirth, many lives, many realms. It's real. If you choose to not believe it, you're just being ignorant, and the ignorance is going to come back and punish you. So, um, so karma is actually the word karma means action. So we are creating karma all the time by our actions and our thoughts. 
That's why we try and practice meditation. It helps to purify our mind, purify our thoughts, and help us get a, 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 an experiential understanding of life. Not just read about it, think about it, but we all have experience and, and we we value our own experience more than anything else. We get lessons from other people, we read books, we go to lectures, we get teachings. That's somebody else's knowledge, that's second hand, that's not ours. We've got our own personal experience in life and that is more valuable, but we've got to then consider it and put them together and think about it and gain some wisdom and know that this is you know, the truth. And the, the meditation helps to do that. We sit and just let the mind go still and watch what happens. Watch the body working. And uh, there are three basic laws which affect all beings in those 31 realms. All life, apart from Nirvana, which is the only escape. And that is suffering, impermanence, and non-self. Suffering, some, the Buddha didn't say all life is suffering. Some people say, oh, Buddhism is pessimistic. You know, he didn't say all life is suffering, but all life leads to suffering. As long as you're still caught up in these 31 realms, you're going to meet suffering at some time. Uh, even if you're having a great time in heaven, you're going to get eventually reborn into the human realm or even into the lower realms if you've got bad karma there, waiting to have its chance. And so you're going to meet suffering. As long as you're getting born, you're going to meet suffering. So suffering's inevitable. Impermanence, change, is inevitable. Nothing stays the same. So things are moving and changing all the time. Every second, you know, things are changing. Um, that's the other law. And the third one, non-self. None of these is me. There's no permanent, solid me. That's, that's one of the things which is a, a difficult thing to people to understand about Buddhism. And I say that's what makes it rebirth instead of reincarnation. We'll talk about that later on in, the, in, the, in another talk. Uh, discuss that more deeply. Uh, so, that'll do for now. Very mind expanding. <coughs> Can you just go over the um, five precepts one more time? Yeah, the know. first one to avoid causing suffering, physical suffering or mental suffering by our actions, killing or harming or torturing or the third, the second one to uh, avoid taking anything which is not ours uh, or cheating people of their property. Uh, the third one, avoiding sexual misconduct. The fourth one, avoiding bad speech false speech, harsh speech, and the fifth one uh, to avoid alcohol, drugs, things which mind alter, mind alter mean you're, you're not in control, you're not, uh, um, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's hard drugs, soft drugs, alcohol, any of them, you know, they, they cause us to lose control. You might nowadays see many temples they try and avoid tell people to stop smoking. Smoking out tobacco is, is not mind altering, you know. It's a craving. Yeah. It is a desire. So if we're doing our best, we should try and reduce our cravings and desires. But it's not easy. You see monks, especially older monks, still chewing betel nut or you know, even even arrogance who've got there still do the same thing. <coughs> so, it's not harming anyone else, you know, by doing But cool, by, by being drunk or something, you often do cause suffering to others, don't you? Right. I mean, drugs, drugs which uses, the drugs are expensive, they often have to supply their, their habit by selling to others or stealing or whatever. So those are the five, and of course, when you're on the eight, you've got the extra three, uh, not eating after midday, not entertaining yourself or decorating yourself, not sleeping on hard, comfortable bed, on soft, comfortable beds. And the third, third one changes to sexual abstinence, mm -hmm. celibacy instead of, so no self-sexual. And, and that's the eight precepts, you know. <coughs>
Um, oh, it is the standard ones which we should all try and keep as well as we Would shaving be considered beautification? No, no, shaving is... is not complete fun. shaving, but to shave just a portion of my beard. Well, you no? do it for comfort. Most people shave for comfort, not yeah. just for, for looking good, you know. But, right. I mean, they, a, a big beard is often hot and uncomfortable. And it yeah. might, might be comfortable in, in, in Alaska, but, uh, <coughs> you, know, he, you know, certainly I find... Since I was a monk, I'm, I like having a, a, a bald head, so I often have very short hair, <laughs> haircuts, and I don't like it when it gets long. It's more uncomfortable in this heat. And so you're not doing it for beautification. Okay. Sometimes you'll hear people say, intention is the most important thing in Buddhism. What you do is what the intention is. You know? okay. You're not intending to, to do it to beautify yourself, but just for, for health reasons, that's okay. I say the soaps and shampoos and things, it's very difficult to find anything which doesn't got any kind of scent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so you just, you know, you're not putting it on because you want to smell, but it's just you can't avoid using it any other way. Um, yeah. That's all there is.